All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fun Wednesdays. So today we're talking about file systems. Fun. So everyone's kind of familiar with this, at least on Linux or Unix or anything besides Windows. So the usual POSIX file system looks something like this. It's part of the FSH, so there's actually a hierarchy standard. That's what that stands for. So it's actually defined, some directories are actually defined as they should exist on a normal Unix system. So there's slash, which is the special root directory, which everything has to start with. And we'll have a lab so you really understand that the root directory is a bit of a special case. And there's really no magic aside from that, aside from a magic number, which we're kind of getting used to. And then in root, there should be a few directories. So there should be a bin directory. That's all your binaries or executables. That on Linux should be elf files. There's a dev directory, which should represent all your devices, an ETC, which should have configuration files, home directory, which should be individual for each users. And in that example, there would be one for like myself, and that's where you would put all your files in. And then there might be a mount directory, something where you mount other devices that you plug into your system, like a USB stick or something like that. So usually there's a concept of a working directory where which is the directory you're currently in. So if you do any relative paths, which everyone's probably done before, they're relative to the current working directory. So there is an absolute and relative path. Relative path is relative to the current working directory. And an absolute path will start with root. So if I'm trying to describe this to do.txt, well, if I'm currently in this John directory, I might be able to say, hey, the relative path is dot. Has anyone ever saw dot entries before, or dot dot, or used dot or dot dot? We got thumbs up, so we'll go over that and see what they actually mean. But for this, the relative path for to do would be dot saying current directory, which is John. There's a file called to do.txt in it. And then if we did an absolute path, it'd be slash home slash John slash to do.txt. So basically, how do I find that to do.txt starting at the root directory? And then similarly for USB, well, if you did the relative one, you would have to start at John. And if that's your working directory, you do dot dot to get to home, which would be up one directory, then dot dot to get to root, then mount USB. So the relative path would be dot dot slash dot dot slash mount USB. And then the absolute path would be root mount USB, and that's it. So. Here's the answers to that. Hopefully that is not terribly surprising. The only things is there's some special symbols here. There is dot, which means the current directory, and then dot dot, which means the parent directory, so whatever you live in. And then there's the tilde sign, if you haven't seen that before, but I'm guessing you have. And it means it's the user's home directory, so where they should store all their files. And then all the relative paths are calculated from the current working directory. If you want to get the current working directory from your shell, you can print out that variable, like echo dollar sign pwd, and that will tell you what directory you're currently in. Or you can just type the command pwd, which essentially will read that for you. So any questions about that? Hopefully straightforward. So. Here's a fun little history lesson. So you know on Linux systems, if you start a file with a dot, it's like a hidden file, kind of a hidden file where you don't really see it. Well, that was actually a big old mistake of someone trying to be way too efficient and uh, too clever for their own good. So within a directory, there's going to be an entry for dot and dot dot, and whenever you ls, typically you don't want to see those. So you would want to hide dot and dot dot, but some tricky developer was like, well, that's two cases, that's silly. I can cover this in one if statement, so if it starts with a dot, I just won't show it. And then suddenly, if your file began with a dot, you wouldn't see it when you typed ls, and then they just made that into a feature. So that's the history behind that. That's why that works, just because someone wanted to cover two cases and wanted to do it with a single if statement. So that's the history of that. That's a fun little thing. So 
when we access our files, we'll either access them sequentially or randomly, and you, this kind of ties into the whole memory thing. So if you read a file sequentially, well, that's what we've usually been doing if we open a file and we read it. So whenever you use a system called read, it advances the position inside the file internally, and we'll see what that looks like a bit today. And then next time you call read, it just continues from where it left off. And consequently, if you went and did writes instead of reads, well, if you did multiple write calls, it would just keep appending to the end, so it would kind of shift that position forward and forward and forward. So if I did a write system call that said hello, and then another one that said there, I would see hello there all in a row, and I wouldn't be overwriting things. So that's usually how you deal with file descriptors and write to files and things like that, but you don't have to. You can randomly access any byte you want in a file. You can read and write them in any order. You can overwrite them. You can do whatever. And for that, you would need a specific position where you want to read a byte from or where you want to write a byte to. So we've already seen the open system call, so that will take essentially a path name, that could be absolute or relative, some flags that would be like read write, so that's what O read write is, write only, read write, uh, also there's a flag called O append that will make that position go to the end of the file, so if I just want to write to the end of the file, you add O append to the flags and then whenever you do a write system call, it will just be appended to the end of the file. So what we haven't seen yet is this lseek system call. And that system call will actually change that internal position for that file descriptor. So you have to give it a file descriptor, uh, that lseek, you have to give it a file descriptor as the first argument, so that's what I want to change internally. And then the second argument is an offset, which is how many bytes do I want to go and then it's relative from the last argument there. So it's an int once, but it can only be one of three values, so it's just like a really crappy enum because this is C and we can't do anything better than that. So once can be either set, seek, sec, seek current, or seek end, and that's where that offset is relative to. So if you do seek set and then give it an offset of say 10, that's relative to the beginning of the file. So that means I want to read the 10th byte or move the position to the 10th byte so whenever I read and write, it goes to the 10th byte. And then if you do current, that is a relative position to wherever the pointer currently is. And as you would probably guess, the end is relative to the end of that file. So if I want to read, I don't know, the second last byte, I could say lseek relative to seek end and then minus two. So I want to come two bytes forward or two bytes back and then I can go ahead and read or write whatever byte I want from there. So it's good to know of this because it will actually cause us problems with uh, the friends we already know like fork. So we already saw how to do this, accessing a directory. So there's open dir, read dir, and close dir. And it works like this. this actually does not translate exactly to a system call, and there's actually a specific format for this, so we'll actually see this uh, in the last lab of the course. But this is what it actually looks like in a process. So each process in its process control block has a file table, and they're just stored there, and the file descriptors are basically just an index into this table. So I kind of alluded before that, hey, file descriptors are just a pointer. So these are the things that they actually point to. So this would have two processes, process one and process two, and it would have three file descriptors that are just represented by their index. And then they each point to an individual uh, file. And there are three components to a file there is a position, so where that internal position is to read or write from for the next byte. There's flags, which would be all the permissions, so read, write, da da da, what you actually can do with the file. And then there is another layer of indirection here. There's a pointer to a V node. 
And a V note is just supposed to represent anything. It can read and write bytes too. So a file would be an example of a V node or your pipe, for example. So that's what it would look like. So in this diagram, process one, file descriptor zero points to this. So it would have a position, flags, which are independent because they point to that entry. And then they point to file A. And then file descriptor one has its own position, own flags, and then points to file B. And then in process two here, file descriptor zero points to its own entry, which would have its own position, which is independent of process one. It would have its own flags. And the V node would also go to that same file. So both of these processes could have that same file open for different purposes. So uh, process one could have it open for writing, process two could have it open for reading, and that is stored in the individual entry. But when you're actually reading and writing bytes to it, you don't really care, it's just a file. And as long as it has the correct flag set for permissions, then it can go ahead and do that operation. So any questions about this? because this actually makes our lives more difficult. So each process has this file table and its process control block. Again, like I said, the file descriptor is just an index to this table, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So each item actually points to a system-wide global open file table, or you can call it a golf table if you really want, a uh, bit of a silly name, but there's just a big global table and that's where all the information about the position and flags are stored and when it points to vnode, and again, vnode, anything that can support a read or write. So that could represent a pipe, network socket, we'll see network sockets, regular files, whatever you want. So remember what happens when you fork. So the process control block is copied on the fork and specifically for us, there is a local file descriptor table, and that would also get copied on a fork. So both process control blocks would point to a global open file table entry, and they would actually point to the same entry, so they would share information, which can cause you some issues. So this is what would happen. So we say we have, again, process control block one, process control block two, and then they're pointing to the same global open file table entry. So this is global, it is managed by the kernel and not independent of each process. So this is what it would look like after a fork. So they would, oh, sorry, yep. So is this why you uh, run each read before calling the get read after the fork? Because you have to Yeah, so this is, so if you call dupe2, it, it essentially replaces whatever that entry points to. So, yeah, so like in here, if we had, you know, what we had in the lab is we set up a pipe, so it would have like file descriptor three points to uh, a global open entry that represents the pipe. And then when you dupe two, you're essentially just making file descriptor one or whatever point to that same entry, and then you can close that entry. So, this is what it would look like after a fork, and you can notice something possibly bad here where they're sharing some information. So if they are sharing a position and one process calls read, well, it's going to advance that position in both processes. So for example, if you tried to read a file and you had to try and read that same file after a fork in both processes, well, because they share that position, one process is going to read some parts of the file and then the other process may read nothing or just a mutually exclusive part of that file. So one might read you know, the first half, one might read the second half, or one might read the entire file, one reads nothing because they actually share that entry there, which sometimes is not what you expect. So yeah, that's one of the gotchas. So that current position is actually shared for both processes because it points to a, that same global entry and that's all it points to. So in addition, 
besides reading and writing, which would change that position for you, one process could also do an lseek system call, and that changes the position for both processes, because both processes are pointing to the same entry. If one process changes that position and the other process is still pointing to it, well, guess what? It's now using that same position. So one process can actually affect the other one through file descriptors, which may not be something you expect. But however, if you don't want this, if you open the same file in both processes after forking, they both create their own independent glo global open file table. The only way you can share global file table entries is just by forking, that's it. You can play with your file descriptors so they look the same, but by default, the only way you can share stuff is actually through forking. So let's say we have this as our main. So in our main, we open to do.txt, say it's read only, and then we fork, and then we open b.txt, it's read only. We assume there's no open files, not even the standard ones. So what would I expect to happen and what would all their relationships be? So I'll give you a sec to do that and then we can go over it. Okay, any guesses as to what will actually happen here? Yep. Yep, yeah, so what's gonna happen here, say I'm running along, process ID two is going and executing this main. When it opens, assume nothing else is open, so it would return a new file descriptor. So if there's nothing open, gets the lowest number, kind of like your thread lab. So to do.txt would be open in process two's file table. There would be an entry for zero, and then it would point to something in this global open file table, and it would have its own position it would have its own flags, and then it would have its own vnode, and then that points to some actual file called to-do, whoops. .txt. And then you go along, you do the fork, so the new process is an exact clone of the parent at the time of the fork, so it would copy that open file table. So in process three, it would have an entry for zero that actually points, whoops, that actually points to that exact same entry. So now they're sharing a position. So now if the child did a read system call or something like that and read the first four bytes, well now the parent can't read the first four bytes without resetting the position and all that stuff. And then afterwards, you don't know what process is going to execute, and they both do an open independently of each other. Whenever you do an open, it creates a new global, uh, global entry in the table. So say process two runs first, it would create a new file descriptor one, which would point to a new entry in the, gl sorry, the global open file table. It would have its own position, it would have its own flags, and it would have its own vnode. Whoops. And then that would point to b.txt. And then in process two, it would do open, create a new entry in its local file table that points to a new global entry. So it would point to this one, which would have its own position, its own flags, and then that vnode 
would point to the same b.txt because it's actually the same file. Yep. Yeah, so that's just to make it easy to share. So they, whenever you fork, they're just all shared by default because they're essentially just pointing to something. Yeah. What does LOS stand for? Lock file? I don't think we actually Sorry? LOS. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so LOF is the local open file table. So that's just the file descriptors pointing to global entries. Sorry. Yeah. So any other questions about this example? So again, here's a nice, nicer picture of what it would look like. So the parent, two file descriptors. So it has two local entries. It's basically just the size of its uh, file descriptor table. It's, yeah, an LOF is a local open file table. And they just point to global entries. So the parent would have two. And the child would also have two. Both their file descriptor zeros are pointing to the same thing because that was done before the fork, so it would have been copied. And then after that, they both open the same file, so they would both have their own global entries that are independent of each other, but they're actually pointing to the same underlying file. Yep. Oh, so this in the middle is the global open file table, and then this, in each process, that's the local file table for each process. Yep. Yeah, the, the local open file table is just a number and then points to the global file table. Yep. Yeah, so 0, 1, and 2 are usually taken, but I said here, assume there's no previously open files, not even the standard ones. So this would be a bit weird, but usually 0, 1, and 2 would be taken, so it'd be the same thing. I just didn't want to write three extra things here. Yep. Yep. Yep, the LSEQ position is the same, changing that position uh, variable there, which is which byte to read in the file. Yep. Um, so the standard ones would usually point to their same Yeah, so the standard ones would point to, su point to the same global open file table as whatever the parent that made them. So usually if you look at that proc file system, which we know how to do now, and look at the standard file descriptors, they all point to the same thing in pretty much every process. Okay, yeah, and this is also why they share and you have a standard input. Why, if you share that over multiple processes, well, only one process is going to read anything you type from the keyboard because they all share that position. So essentially, the active one would read it and then the other ones can't read it. So that's why your standard in only gets read by one process and not everything in the tree. Okay, so now talking about how we actually store files on your file system. So we saw SSDs yesterday. We saw that they contain pages, which are basically just fixed size blocks of memory. So if we want to store a file, well, we would store them also in pages. So one way to store them would be like contiguous allocation. So say I have a green file that would span like three pages. Well, I could just allocate it somewhere on that SSD, and then to describe where that file is, I can tell you what page it starts with and how many pages it has, right? That would be contiguous allocation. I don't have to tell you much about it. Then for the red file, I can tell you where it starts, tell you it has six pages, and then for the blue file, I tell you where it starts, tell you it has four pages. So. Is this a good idea to do with file, or is this a good idea for your file system? So, yep. Yeah, so if I get rid of something, it might leave a weird size gap that I can't fill. In addition, uh, it's a bit better because 
I'm using pages, so I'm going to have page size gaps, but there might not be enough pages to fill something. But also, typically, you make files bigger and smaller. So what would happen if I wanted to make that red file bigger? Yeah, well, I, I could, but what would I have to do? Yeah, so I couldn't make it bigger because it would overrun into the blue, and then I can't say it's like seven now because it's wherever blue is. So I could just take it, move it here, and then copy all those pages, copy all, that, all the contents of that file, and then just stick the new block at the end of that because now I have room for it. Or I could have moved the blue file down, copied all of it, and then just made space for the red. But typically, this is pretty, pretty bad, pretty wasteful. And we've kind of already solved this problem we, when we had memory, right? So memory was also in pages exactly like this. What did we do for memory? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did do multi-level page tables. But even without doing multi-level page tables, we just made different mappings, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, well, or we could use a free list. That's another option. So both are valid options. We'll get to yours later, so let's start with yours. So first, OK, yeah, contiguous is really fast as long as there's no modifications. Really space efficient, because if I was to describe a file to you, again, all I have to say is what page or block it starts at and how many blocks it takes up in its size. So it's really fast to, rent or to access any block in a file because you can figure out what block it's supposed to be in. So if I said, for example, this is a long-winded way of saying, assume the block size is that four kilobyte page. Well, if I want to write, or if I want to read byte 5,000, well, I know it's on block two for that file. So I can just go over one and read it. I don't have to traverse through every other block or read anything. I can directly look it up because it's essentially like a array lookup. But files can't grow easily. There's internal fragmentation. So remember, we kind of talked about fragmentation, where it's essentially just wasted space. And for all of this, since the file system only cares about blocks and pages, and they're all the same fixed size, we don't have to worry about any external fragmentation when files are deleted or truncated because all our blocks are the same size, so one's just as good as the other. But we're going to have some internal fragmentation where, hey, if I have a file that's only 10 bytes and a block is you know, 4,000 bytes, well, essentially, most of those bytes are going to be wasted, but that's just what file systems do. That's the trade-off they have. Every file system is going to have that trade-off where they only deal with blocks and they don't care about individual bytes. So here's our linked list idea where we could just store a linked list of pages. So this is called linked allocation. And if you were to do this, well, you actually have to store the pointer on the block itself. So for example, if a file started here at block 0, well, it needs a pointer to point to the next block, and then that block points to the next block, which points to the next block, points to the next block, points to the next block. And eventually, that block will have a null pointer to say, hey, that's the end of the file. It's essentially just a linked list, but it's just distributed over blocks. So what you do here is you give up a little bit of space in the block to store the pointer. So instead of using 4,096 bytes to store data, say I use eight bytes for a pointer, so I just lose eight bytes in my block, but you know that's something you can live with. Now, files can grow and shrink quite easily because it's that same idea as memory or the file system. One page is as good as the next. So if I want to, whoops, if I want to make this file bigger by a block, I can just go to the end here and then grab a new unused page and then point to that page and say that's the next block and I make my file bigger. And it doesn't care, they don't have to be contiguous or anything like that, I can just do that. So now we can grow and shrink them as we want. It's still that same thing with external fragmentation, internal fragmentation, that's just a trade-off we'll make. But this is a bit slow, right? 
So if we want to access, say, block four, right, I have to read this block, access like the pointer on this block, and typically you assume that things are nice and cached on blocks, but to get to the next pointer, I have to go to a new block, which won't be cached because it's really far away, read a pointer there, now next block, not going to be cached, too far away, read a pointer there, oh, that sucks, it's too far away, and I have to read it, I'm not going to be able to use a cache, it's going to be really, really slow. So, can you think of a better way to speed that up and to get those pointers closer together? Yep. So, yeah, so the idea was to keep all the pointers in the first block, or alternatively, you can just keep all the pointers separately to describe that block. So essentially, you just have a bunch of pointers all in a row that are all, all right next to each other, so you just have like an array of pointers. And then if you need to walk through the blocks, well, they're not far away anymore. It will hopefully be within that page. Maybe it takes other pages, depending on how big the file is. But you can just walk through the blocks. They'll all be relatively close together, and hopefully it will be faster. So that's exactly what a file allocation table is. The file allocation table is just a list of pointers and it just makes all the pointers right next to each other. So instead of storing the pointers on the blocks themselves, the blocks are now free and you have this separate table that, this, that has an index for every block and you can point to them. So at index zero, it would point to block six, at a block six would point to two, 2 would point to 13, 13 points to 9, 9 points to 18, and we're done. So this is the first file system that's actually used. So how many have heard of something called FAT32 or something like that? So that's what this is. So FAT32 means it's a file allocation table. 32 means the pointers are 32 bits in size. So your pointers are 4 bytes. So this is an actual one that's actually used, and everyone, if you're using a Windows computer, you are using this because your boot drive has to be formatted this way. So that's what FAT32 is, and it's the first useful one. So essentially, it's linked allocation, but we put all the pointers together so it's not as wasteful. We can use the whole block, and everything is nice and closer together. Um, so it's got faster random access. So if the file allocation table can be held in memory or cached, well, computers are really good at accessing values that have, are close together, so hopefully it's really, really fast. But the bad thing is each file needs to have a file allocation table, and all the size of the file allocation table is proportional to the size of the disk because it has to be able to point to any single block on the disk. So the bigger your disk is, the bigger the file allocation table has to be, and that's per individual file. So it gets really out of control really fast, which is why people don't use them for anything that is like gigabytes of size or something like that. It's just too crappy and you waste way too much space. So can we think of a better idea than a file allocation table, even though it's actually something that's used? So we heard multi-level page tables, right? So would mul the multi-level page table idea work for this? Or what about something simpler? So at the end of the day, oh, uh, uh, yeah. Distributed? Distributed? Whoops. OK, so kind of like multi-level-ish. So at the end of the day, for multi-level or even single level, what does it do? So essentially it takes a virtual address and looks it up, turns it into a physical one. 
So if you want it to be really, really fast for files and do that, well, essentially that's just like a table lookup, you could do the same thing. So what about just an array of pointers and entry zero points to block zero for that file. Entry one points to block one. Entry two points to block two. So you just make an array of pointers that aren't this crazy thing, but the first pointer points to the first block or zeroth block. Da, 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 they all point to the next block. You essentially just turn into an array. So that's what indexed allocation is. So index allocation is just an array of blocks for an individual file. So they just point to that. So if I have a file, you essentially just give it an array. And if I want to look up block four, well, it's like looking up element four in an array. That's really, really easy. I know exactly what byte to go to. So if I want to see what byte four is, well, I have block four and it points to this block. So block four of my file is that block on the hard drive. So does that make sense to everyone? So the idea from multi-level page tables here is this red block here. So in order to store all the indexes, you store all the indexes on a page. And then to describe a file, you say, oh, where is its array pretty much? So its array would live in a block and that block just has a bunch of pointers for that file. So it would, yeah, so it just, same idea as kind of multi-level page tables of just fitting pointers on a block. And this is kind of the idea of a single level multi, single level page table. Yep. Yeah, so the question is what happens if I want to grow the file? So in this case, it on, if, say my page size is four kilobytes and I can fit like a thousand blocks, I can grow my file up to a thousand by just adding more pointers, right? The problem is, is when I run out of space on that block and then that becomes the multi-level page table <laughs> idea. <laughs> Whoops. So we'll get to that next lecture, but essentially when we run out, we'll pretty much use the multi-level page table idea. So, yep. Professor, so then for uh, the for fat before mm. the previous one, where is where are the the, the two columns stored? Like so those table? yeah, so those two columns would be stored on the drive as well, but the size of them depends on how big the hard drive is. So I can't draw them because I have no idea how big they would be. So whenever you format a drive, it would figure out how big it needs to be and make it the right size. Yep. Um, so how do you array, like every file takes up a separate block for the array? Yeah, so to describe a file in this case, I would say, hey, this file, its index block is at page red. So if you want to figure out any block that makes up the file, start at page red and use it as an array. Just one file. Yeah, so the red block here is just that, essentially that array of pointers for one individual file. So if I was to describe the file to you as part of the file system, I would say, hey, if you want to read to do.txt, all of its indexes are the red block. So go read the red block. Yep. Yeah, so this one's not linear to disk, uh, disk size, but it's only using one block, so it's gonna have some limitations here. So my file can only be a certain size, so it was like uh, the point that was brought before. As soon as I run out of pointers that fit on the block, I can't make the file any bigger anymore. So it's not necessarily better because it's limited in this regard. Yeah, okay. so we'll work out. So yeah, so talking about its limits, so it can shrink and grow. We still have the same fragmentation things. Fast random access time because it's essentially an array. But now we're at a limitation where the file size is limited by the maximum size that can fit in a block, right? Our index block can, is just lives on a block. So let's see. So let's see how big of a file it could actually support. So 
In this example, we'll say that our index block stores a bunch of pointers to data blocks, so there's no other information. It's just literally pointing to a block that has its own index. And then we'll say that the size of a block on a disk is eight kilobytes, so it's a bit bigger, and then a pointer to a block is four bytes. So the question is, what's the maximum size of file that can be managed by this index block? So give you two seconds to think, or a little bit to think about that. Oops. All right, how big can my file be? <laughs> yeah. 2,000, how big is 2,000, 2,000 pointers in, I don't know, actual megabytes or something like that? Oh, it's not 8,000 AIB. If you have a, a pointer to a block is four bytes. Yeah. A disk block is eight AIB in size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you divide, but that's how many pointers you can fit on a block. And then each of those pointers points to a block that's eight kilobytes, so you multiply them together. Right here. Oh, file. Yeah, file, sorry. Another comment? No? Yeah. Okay, so just really quick. It's like the same idea of page tables. So this is my block size if I write it in powers of two. So it's two to the 13, and then if I want to answer how many pointers I can fit on a block, well, this is my pointer size. And then if I want to answer how many of them fit in a block, well, I just divide them. So how many pointers fit on a block? Well, that is, if we do our fun math, it's two to the 11. So this is number of pointers So if I only have one block that can represent my file, I can point up to two to the 11 things. And if I want to get the, max, the size of the file, oops. Well, I have two to the 11 pointers and each pointer points to a block. The block is two to the 13. So that's the maximum size of my file, which would be two to the 24 and if I want to go ahead and change that into units, we can actually understand. That's the same as two to the four times two to the 20. And then that's two to the four meg e bytes because it's powers of two and we're not trying to swindle you. And then two to the four, whoops, is just 16. So the maximum size of a file for this would be 16 megabytes. So who here would be satisfied with that? We got one. So someone that doesn't care about movies or like animated GIFs or anything like that. So that's a good idea. So far we've had a good idea. And here's the calculation just so you have it. So, so far that was a good idea, but it's not quite practical. Maybe enough for some text files, but we have to do a bit better than that. And we'll do a bit better than that tomorrow in the cursed room, unless I, unless we want to do lab three stuff. Yeah. So this still kind of does scale linearly, right? With the number of like blocks, because like you, you have one pointer per block. Yep. And then you have, depending on the number of blocks, you have like a, it increases until it hits the maximum limit, right? Yeah, so for this, my file is represented by a block of indexes, but as soon as I run out of things I can fit on that block, that's it. So I have a limitation with the size of the file, but to describe my file, I just say, hey, where's its index block? That's it. Okay, so file systems, very good for persistence. It's the software layer on top of that because for SSDs, you just get a bunch of blocks or pages, however you want to think of it, 
and it's up to the kernel to decide. So you need a file system on top of that to enable persistence and file systems just describe how files are stored on disk. The first and only one we've seen today that is actually usable is that FAT or file allocation table. The, all the other ones are kind of a work in progress that we're working on. And we'll see the real thing either tomorrow or Wednesday. But API-wise, we can open files, change the positions. It will, it will actually use the file system under the hood to figure out what physical block on the hard drive it should point at. Then we saw each process has its own local open file table, and there is a global open file table, which is where, whenever you call open, actually creates entries for. And then as part of fork, it copies all those pointers there, so you're pointing to the same entry in the global open file table. Then we saw some more interesting allocation strategies for the actual disk itself, so contiguous, which we argued doesn't work, linked, which we argued sucks, and then fat, which is just linked, but all the pointers are closer together, and people actually use that. And then we saw indexed, which isn't actually used, and we'll go over what's actually used instead of indexes, but you can probably guess. It could have the same idea with multi-level page tables where we take a few hops, and then we have a much larger space we can actually use. So with that, just remember, pulling for you, we're on this together.